um, yeah, that was a lot of fun. I, I learned a lot, too. Uh, so I, I really enjoyed that as well. Um, OK, so I'm now going to talk about the DIR floor plan model of development. Um, this model here, the material that we're going to go through, is based on the clinical work and the research of Dr. Stanley Greenspan and Dr. Serena Weider. Um, so there, there's uh, quite a bit of uh, there's many publications that uh, if anybody has any questions after, I can point anyone in the, the right direction, but we're gonna talk about a synthesis um, of this here. So uh, some of our goals for this part of our presentation is we are going to um, have a, try and establish a familiarity of the functional, emotional, developmental capacities. Okay, that's a, a couple of big words, the FEDCs as they're called. And uh, as we'll see, this is a model of development, like we said. Uh, so these are the different levels of development that we all go through. And uh, as we get to the FADCs, uh, I'll mention this again, but what we are looking at, this is a typical model of development. This is what we uh, would typically expect. And this is important to understand when looking at it from this perspective, because if we understand what we sh should be expecting or would be expecting when there is a deviation, we can understand where that deviation is and why there's a deviation and where we need to go in and do the work. Um, we're going to understand the importance of an individualized profile for each child. Uh, this we've already talked about quite a bit today with the sensory integration, um, understanding the sensory profile, and I think hopefully we all felt a little bit about uh, our own sensory profiles, how one of these activities might have been easier, might have been more difficult, uh, was more soothing, was um, more, um, well, the opposite of soothing, whatever. Alerting. Alerting, Alerting. Thank you. yes. Irritated. Yeah. Irritated, yeah, no, that too, that too. Um, we are going to generate ideas about how emotions give meaning to the experience and learning in the context of relationships. So the relationship piece, this, this uh, the floor time model is a relationship-based model. So the interaction between a child and a caregiver or any two people really, the relationship between the two of them is going to inform how that interaction proceeds. Um, and we will also, at the end, our strategies over here, we're going to talk about the use of floor time specific strategies for specific situations. So that's a preview of what is coming. So um, as I said at the, at the start, I am a floor time provider and I'm also a play therapist. So uh, what does that mean, a play therapist? What, well, we, um, play is very important. Um, we, uh, we can see that play allows children to learn about themselves, they can learn about others, and they can learn about the world. Um, and this is done especially early in early childhood. This is done specifically through play. This so, is a big component of kind of what we do together between DIR yes. and the sensory piece. Yes, absolutely. Building muscle control, learning new things, trying things out, benefiting from those kind of exactly. strategies. Right, and, and I think we can even see a little bit today. You know, we had our presentation here, yeah. right? And we wouldn't necessarily put our six and seven year olds down in these chairs and say, okay, here is your information, let me <laughs> teach you that. Yeah. But in just even us getting up and trying out these different activities, I think, I, 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 like I said, I know I learned something from mm -hmm. just going through this here. I hope you know, we all did too, but that's through the natural, um, the, the natural play and the interaction here. So as we said, children learn through their play. Play is actually the optimal learning environment for young children. Um, it is uh, very vital to how they're able to take in the information. <coughs> it allows them to learn how to handle change, right? because the play is always going to be changing, especially when there's a peer, um, how to be adaptable to that change and be flexible, which is um, very important for all kids. Um, it is a universal le learning skill, right? So I, I think this is sometimes uh, something that I hear from time to time, my child doesn't play. but. I would reframe that to say, my child plays differently than I might have expected. All children play. That's an important thing to keep in mind. It is, as we see here, universal to everyone. It's just a matter of understanding what are the specifics of how each child might play. Also through this play, children will explore their emotions through the relationships with others within the context of the play. So some of the more heightened emotional situations that might be difficult to manage if it's done through a play scenario, it makes it easier for the child to get that experience and also get the positive experience of I negotiated that emotion in a way that felt good to me. Um, a few other things in regard to play, um, they take in, children can take in new ideas, they can figure out how things work through play, um, they can solve problems, um, they learn to cooperate with others. 
Um, I had an experience a couple years ago. I was um, pulling out of uh, a driveway, and you know there were two cars coming down the road this way, and one car got there before me. So I said, okay, he's there first. He's gonna go. And then after him, I thought the collective understanding was he would go, then I would go, and then the next person would go. But the first person goes, and then the second person quickly speeds through. <laughs> and I, I think I was alone in the car at the time, but I said out loud to no one, I said, well, I know what you were like in kindergarten. <laughs> and, and I looked around and said, I'm talking to myself. Yeah. Um, but that's, you know, that's the idea there, that some of these skills that we see, especially later on in life, we can trace them back to how we played. So it's important to, um, it's an important understanding of how to use play in an optimal way. So the, some of the goals here of the DIR floor time model, and we'll, we'll explain in a couple of slides what exactly that means, um, but some of the goals here um, are to build healthy foundations to allow a child to develop the social, emotional, and intellectual capacities. So I think what is unique about this model, um, you know, when you talk about child development, um, there are some of the big names that we might think of, uh, whether it's Erickson, whether it's Piaget. So this model actually grew out of some of that, but looking at what models already existed, but said there is a social emotional component that is not necessarily addressed in those. So how can we incorporate that? Because as we have seen and as we will see, this is very important to a child's development as well. Um, it's also important to know that children are born, all children are born with a desire to interact with others. From a neuroscience perspective, that's how our brains are geared um, towards connecting with other individuals. Um, and it's a similar type of idea, like we said before, with the play that, it, that every child plays. Also, every child wants to connect with others. So understanding that desire, even though the execution of that might be different, and not might be, is different from child to child, Understanding that that is an underlying goal to drive children forward um, is an important piece for us to know. So healthy social emotional development, this comes from the spontaneous communication between the child and the caregiver, right? So children, in addition to wanting to play, wanting to interact with others, they want to be social um, and they want to learn. Children are curious about the world. So the way we learn, again, it's not necessarily through sitting down at a lecture, but it's through the social interactions with others. So that's a major part of this as well. And therefore, because the social interactions are so key, having a relationship that promotes a joyful and pleasant engagement is very important for that learning to take place in a way that the child benefits, that everybody feels good about, that you wanna keep doing. So the question that we now have is, what is DIR? What does it mean? What does it stand for? Right? Up until now, it's just a bunch of letters. Um, but we will go through each of these uh, a little bit of a, at a time to sort of build this picture of what it is, a, way, a lens through which we can look at a child's development. So the D is developmental. The I stands for individual difference. And the R is relationship-based. So we're going to have our developmental model here where we'll look at the different stages. Those were the FEDCs we mentioned before. We're going to look at individual differences, understanding how every person is different and how they perceive the world is different. And relationship-based, understanding the importance of relationships in all of this. So as we said, for developmental, we're going to spend a little bit of time here talking about the social emotional model of development. This is what we said before, the FEDCs over here. Um, and it's important for us to understand at the beginning uh, that these, these models, I, I think this is one thing that, um, that actually differentiates the DIR model from other models, is that we have these different steps that we want to build, similar to your triangle, right? We want to start with the foundation and move up. Um, other developmental models might say that you have to completely master a stage before you move on to the next. But as we'll see today, we can still move forward, but just because we move up in a stage doesn't mean the earlier stages are necessarily going to be rock solid. And without that solid foundation, we can see how it affects later on. Um, this is the individual difference part. Um, again, we, we're saying we are all different. 
Uh, we all perceive the world differently. Um, from, the, from birth, infants and all individuals have our own unique characteristics uh, that will determine how we participate in the social world. So in, in truth, I'm not gonna go too much into the individual differences today because your experts in individual differences already told us uh, really all the information that we need. Uh, but we all have a unique uh, physiological, neurological, psychological, motor communication, and sensory processing system. So it's everything, that everything about us, all these different aspects over here is unique to us. So it's important to understand that um, about ourselves and about the, uh, the children that we will be interacting with. And then to go just a little bit more into the relationship-based piece, um, a loving and trusting relationship with a parent or a caregiver, a caretaker, is key to the development of social emotional growth. So this concept right here that I want to talk about for just a minute, secondar secondary altruciality, um, is uh, a couple of big words that actually um, Microsoft Office will put the little red squiggly because they say this is not a word. But think about this for a second. Um, the way, if you were to compare um, the gestation period of humans compared to all other species, right? Humans are born completely helpless, right? We, if you look at like giraffes, giraffes are born, they're walking almost instantly, right? We have, um, when, I, when I teach uh, undergraduate, I teach developmental, I say, okay, so now we have a baby. What can it do? Not much, honestly. <laughs> Um, our, when we are born, we are completely dependent on our caregivers. We rely on them to survive. And this theory of secondary altruciality is because of that reliance and because of that relationship that we then have to develop, develop with our caregivers, that's what helps our brains develop in the ways that they do with the higher level functioning that the other animals don't have. Yeah. No pressure now. Yeah. <laughs> well, yeah. but that's that's yeah. the other thing that we're going to see. We yeah. uh, and we're hopefully going to point out over here that we actually all of this stuff, the same idea that we might not have thought about the specifics of how we're going to pick up that uh, little sheep over there and drop it over there. We might not have thought about what specifically we need to do, but we actually knew how to do it, right? So, so too here, we're going to go through this and see. Okay, this is not all you know crazy science and all beyond me. You know, I always say from the start when I'm working with a family, I say, I'm here, I have this training, but you're, you know your child better than anybody. So you are the best qualified to, um, to help your child learn and grow. Sorry. Um, yes. Can I just ask, so is the altruciality, is that the reliance on the... Um, so, so that refers to, um, that refers to the way that our brains develop because of that relationship. Out of okay. the, right, out of the reliance, yeah. Okay, so it's the development of the brain through the relation through the relation. Thanks, Silver. Yes. Well, yeah. What does the word specifically yeah. mean? Yeah. <laughs> you know, that's a good question. Specifically, <laughs> yeah. the word. Um, yeah. I, I just I, I wanted to yeah. put the theory for it. It's here. a theory. Yeah. yeah. Okay. Yeah. So it's yeah. not. Yeah. I think a good way that kind of um, came up while we were doing kind of the conversations was talking about um, utilizing some of the sensory strategies and will this be something that my child will grow out of? Will they always need these type of things? And so that's kind of what like should be talking about. So you develop that relationship, you help them learn how to kind of build and grow and then develop and then gain some independence. Similar to the sensory strategies and similar to the sensory processing, once they can regulate themselves, then they start to learn some more skills and kind of grow outside of that. But you, through your relationship, develop those skills and kind of help them move on. Right. Development is through? It's through that relationship with somebody else. Yes. Exactly. Yes, and we'll, we'll see as we keep going just how all of that works together. Yeah. Great, thank you both. Okay, so these are some of the FEDCs. Um, this slide here is just a preview. We're gonna go through these individual levels, and this is the D, the developmental part of the model. So we have <coughs> shared attention and regulation, engaging and relating, two-way purposeful communication, and we'll go through each of these in more detail. Um, complex gestures and shared problem solving, creative and emotional ideas, and abstract and logical thinking. Um, we're gonna actually cover a few more of these, but these six actually occur typically within the first three years of a child's life, um, so, and beyond throughout the lifespan. So we'll, we'll see a little bit about that. Um, okay, so, yes. Just a question, you're, my, you're maybe gonna cover this later, but is that like a pyramid? So one develops before, has to necessarily develop before the other, so or? this is the pyramid idea okay. that we were talking about, but I wanna point out again, thank you for asking. It, it, the way this model is put together is that it doesn't necessarily have to be in that order. We can progress 
but it's not going to be as robust at the higher levels if we aren't as solid on the lower levels. Um, I give, uh, well, I'll give, I'll give the example um, later on if, if I forget. Yeah, but the I was going to say you kind of the way um, when Tuvi and I were working on the presentation, one of the ways he described this to me was a ladder. So you can yes. move up and down the ladder, move mm -hmm. up and down the levels, and if you reach a level and you're seeing some challenges, you can back down and kind of work on some of those other things and then kind of move around mm -hmm. that way. Yes. So right. it doesn't have to be you've, you've climbed the mountain and now you're here. You can go back down the mountain and then kind of figure it out. Or right. or another concrete example you guys can think of too is like if you, um, something that I'm sure you've all experienced is handwriting. So if your kid, mm -hmm. can, they can write, right? They can write the letters, but sometimes it might take them a lot longer. They can't keep up with the speed and the pace of what's going on. They no longer wanna write because like it's taking them so long and they're belaboring it. It's not that they can't do a higher level skill, but they can't expand upon that higher level skill and get the enrichment of it because they're missing some of the pieces below. So you can continually work on the bottom while you're working on the top. I think mm -hmm. that's what you're saying. Yes. You can yeah. go and you can address it and you'll get the most once they're all fully developed, but you can certainly move throughout them. Right. Yes, and we'll and we'll get into that even more okay. as we go. Yeah. Um, okay. So let's uh, let's start to uh, look at these over here. So, ah, we're over here. Okay. So um, now, quick question: Has anybody held a baby recently? And what a baby means, we can define. Okay. Yeah. We've had. I had two. Okay. But yeah. we've we've had um, experience holding babies in the past, right? So we can think as we go through this, just think about these different stages in life. So we're, again, looking at this from a model of typical development. So let's think about this in these, um, where is our pointer? Well, in these the button time, middle. Perfect. In these time frames that we would typically expect to see them, um, but then we'll see how it, this might apply later on in life as well. So the first thing, so I, as I said before in my class, as I say, okay, so what can a baby do? Not much, but the first thing that the baby learns is the ability to be calm and regulated, right? So regulation is a key point here, right? So what we have, we want the baby to be calm, be attentive, be interested. This is the first step to thinking and learning, okay? So this is the first thing that this baby is gonna learn from zero to three months old, that they are present uh, to the degree that they can at that stage. Um, that they can be calm and they can pay attention to the world around them. As we said, as we've seen through our senses, our perception, this is how we learn about the world. We take in information. So we have to be able to attend to that information. So being regulated, right? Being calm, being relaxed, where does that come from? How do we learn that? We learn that from our caregivers, right? So a baby, imagine the baby is crying, right? And the parent comes running into the room. And what does the parent do? Does the parent come in and say, why are you crying? Yeah. No, that is not a regulated parent. So the child will then react to that with that same dysregulation. But what does the parent do? The parent comes in, picks up the baby, soothes the baby, starts to slow down, calm down, shows the baby, I am regulated. This is what being regulated is. This is external regulation coming from the parent. And through this external regulation, then the child will start to learn a mutual regulation that at this stage, sometimes the baby doesn't know how to calm down yet, but the baby knows they can calm down with the help of the caregiver. So, oh, you're here now and you're calm, I can do that too. Not that they're gonna say these words at this stage, but that's, that's the idea. And then from that mutual regulation, the baby starts to learn self-regulation, that I've done this before, I've been upset, but now I'm able to calm myself down, and I remember how to do that, and I know how to do that. So all of this happens roughly within the first three months of life, that this is the first thing that the child is gonna learn, and this is extremely important because paying attention and attending to the world is the first step of thinking, right? We have to be able to pay attention to all these sensory information in order to make sense out of it. So, I have written down here, and I know if you're looking at this slide, you're probably already thinking, okay, I see a typo. It's not a typo, though. We have zero to three months over here, and we have two to seven months over here. So I know mathematically that doesn't quite work out, but the point, the reason why it's put together in this way is that it is a range, and everybody is going to learn these things at different stages, and kind of like we were saying before, you can start to learn a little bit about level two as you're still working on level one. What we'll see, so we've used the example of a ladder, but we can also use the example of a house, right? So you build the first level, the first floor, 
And only when you have the first floor solid enough can you then build the second floor. Mm -hmm. But as you're building the second floor, maybe you build a wing on this side, add a room over here. So as we're still building up, we're also building out on the lower levels, the foundational levels too. So we have this little baby now. The baby is able to be calm, right? The baby is able to pay attention, to note that there are other people in the room. And what does the baby start to do now? The baby starts to have mutual engagement and form relationships. So if we think about that early little infant there in those first couple of months, they don't really know who you are yet. You know, they're not necessarily looking at you. They're not, they don't have, <coughs> down here, they don't have a gleam in the eye, right? That's, that's what we really look for. We say that level two is when the baby, you and the baby fall in love. That's when this happens, right? So we can even back up a step and see how it's necessary to be able to attend to the other person in order to be able to mutually engage with them. So this is, as we said, falling in love. This is the, the gleam in the eye. And being in sync with another will allow the child to make meaning out of the information that the sensory system is taking in. Okay, so having that connection now, right, we already learned about how we can have regulation from another, but having that connection with another also helps us uh, understand the world better. Here we start to see um, uh, affective cues. So by affect, we mean showing emotion, right? So this is where we first get to see the baby smile. You know, up until then it was just, was it a smile? And it was probably they just had some gas, that's what it was. But when they get to this stage, they will actually start to smile at you when they see you. Um, they recognize you, they're happy to see you. Um, and these cues, and how do you respond, right? When the baby smiles at you, we smile right back. We make the same faces, they make a, a cooing sound, we coo right back, we talk to them, right? And we have this connection here, and this helps keep them engaged, helps keep them curious about the world, and comfortable in many different situations. So this is what happens from level one to level two. And again, keep in mind as we go, when we move from, uh, if, if we were to be in this stage, and for whatever reason become dysregulated, think about now how much harder it is to maintain that engagement when we're dysregulated. So building out of this, and this is roughly three to 10 months, so I know our numbers here are gonna be really confusing, but it all works together. This is where we get our two-way intentional communication. Okay, so this is the reciprocity. So if we're thinking about it in terms of an infant here, uh, reciprocity being the back and forth. So up until now, you know, first we just had the baby who was there, who was looking around interested. Then we had the baby who was looking at you, happy to see you. Mm -hmm. Here we start to have a little bit of a back and forth. The baby starts to try to communicate with you. Not with language yet, but with their gestures. You know, here we might, see, we might start to see the arms moving around, not necessarily in a directed sort of way, but this is where they get excited to see you. They try to talk to you. We have our back and forth. The idea of circles of communication is an important thing within this model, that a circle of communication is if the child will initiate some sort of interaction, and then you as the caregiver respond, and then the child responds to that. So that three point points, I think I always say, it's kind of like a triangle more so than a circle, but it's called a circle of communication. And we can have this back and forth, and that might be something as simple as the baby looks at you and makes a sound, and you make the sound back, and then they make the sound. And that's a circle of communication that, if we back up a second, you needed to be regulated to be able to do, and you needed to have that mutual engagement to have that reciprocity going back and forth. Um, here we also see, uh, as we said, the movements from the baby. The reason why they're able to do this now is because in this stage we have something called affect to intent. So there is the aspect of I think, and therefore I want, and they can start to act on it. We don't have the organization to be able to actually um, accomplish our goals so much at this stage, but this is where we can start to think about, this is what I want, and I want to do that. So from there, and, and here we're still you know, within the first year of life. From there we have our complex gestures and shared problem solving. So this comes roughly in the second year of life. Um, this is where we have the ability to start to problem solve with another. Okay, so here, this is where before we had the baby just waving their arms around, now they're actually able to reach out to say either with a gesture or maybe even a word, pick me up, you know, up, I want you to hold me. So it's not just a matter of arms flailing around, there is the intention here, and there is a problem that the baby is then trying to solve. Um, here we have, if we had affect to intent before, here we had the wish, then the intention, and then the execution. 
right? So something like the shared problem solving, I'm just thinking when I was over there with the ref, right? We had to actually think that through. This is what I want to do, right? How am I going to do that? And now am I actually going to be able to execute that? So while we were all doing that over there successfully, we were handling uh, FEDC4 as we were doing that. Um, okay, so, and this is also, I should mention, this is when the baby starts to have a sense of self. This is when this starts to develop. Um, but we won't, we won't go into that because that can move us in a whole different direction. Um, so after FEDC4, and again, keep in mind how all these keep building on each other, uh, we get to number five, which is where the child starts to have creative and emotional ideas. So this is where we have the emergence of symbols. Now symbols or symbolic thinking, this is where we can have words mean something else. Drawings, pretend play, all the games we play, it can mean something other than what I am currently experiencing. Right, so we've said this whole time how the baby takes in the world. Well, everyone, we take in the, the, uh, the sensory perception, we use our sensory perception to make sense of the world. But here we're able to kind of step out of that, right? It's not simply uh, a life of action, it's a life of the mind. We're able to think about different situations, different scenarios. Um, as the child gets a little bit older, they can start to visualize themselves in a different scenario. So they can think about something like, yes, I can be brave even if I'm scared. Something like that. That it's not just, oh, this is the state I'm in right now, and this is just what I'm gonna be in forever. They start to get this sense that there could be more to the here and now. And that's through that symbolic thinking. It's through what, what I'm seeing can, be, can symbolize something else. And then the sixth, sixth stage over here, um, which is really three to four years old, is where the child can start to build bridges <clears throat> between these ideas, have some abstract thinking that is not necessarily as concrete as we might have seen earlier, and they can connect different ideas, different creative symbols that they have put together to build longer strings of thought. And this is how they continue to learn. And I think we can see how their, um, their learning grows throughout each of these stages. Um, so these are, this is one through six. Uh, as it turns out, a lot of DIR floor time will focus on these early six because uh, what really, <clears throat> what we get to is, as I, I said before, we learn these things early in life but it is a developmental matter, and just because we are capable of learning how to do this, this doesn't mean if you've mastered it, you've got it, move on, don't think about it again. We move up and down the ladder depending on the situation. And one of the great examples that we saw today, maybe if somebody touched the sand over there and it made them feel not so good, that might have brought you down the ladder a little bit and got you a little dysregulated, right? So then we have to figure out, okay, how can I attend to this activity while I'm feeling dysregulated? What do I have to do to repair? So that's that's some of our ideas here. Yeah. Sorry, I just wanted to ask you. So, do you have do you see in children and adults sort of issues with later FEDCs if these aren't solid? Yes. So if if there are problems in any of the first one to six, mm -hmm. those are like the basic ones. That if those if there is issues there, you're not going to be able to. Well, I, so yeah, so yes, yeah, the answer, it's, the short answer is yes, but if we think back to our house, you know, we're building yeah. each FEDC as a different floor. Yeah. If the third floor is not so great, then the sixth and seventh and eighth floors are going to be, you know, in, in worse shape even. Right. Or, and, and maybe you could get up there and you could move around, but it would still be a little hesitant. Yeah. But another important thing I think to remember, mm -hmm. and we talk about this a lot as well, is that we all have like difficulties in, in areas, right? Mm -hmm. Like yeah. we like just the way TV is describing, I don't know who exactly, but like just because you touched the sand and it was dysregulating for you doesn't mean you need therapy. Mm -hmm. Like it really is a matter of how much is it dis like disrupting mm -hmm. your day to day life, your ability to function in your individual roles. And as an adult we have different individual roles than as a child and in different stages. So like some of our children did very well when they were young and parents were able to meet their needs. Mm -hmm. It's more when they were going off on their own and you no longer have the world revolving around you. It's more you needing to meet all these time mm -hmm. expectations, you know, demands that are being placed on you by being mm -hmm. in different types of environments. If you can if you can be quirky, like we're all quirky and all yeah. have different things. If you can be quirky and get through your day, mm -hmm. fine. If it's more with your 
spending so much time trying to plan around to meet the kids' needs or meet your needs, and it's interfering with your ability to participate, that's yeah. when I think is mm -hmm. like, okay, let's look and see what happened. Because we are all not fully developed in every area. Like, right. there's very yeah. few people that I've ever met that are like, the perfect. <laughs> like, you know what yeah. I mean? Yeah. Yeah. I know I've got my quirks, we all have them, so it's more a matter of that. I mean, I, I'm sure we all know people who say, I don't like the tag on this, I'm gonna cut it out. Mm -hmm. You know, people who, when the subway is coming, they will cover their ears because it's loud. Mm -hmm. You know, does, does that necessarily mean that we have to intervene? No, it's, everybody has their own way. <laughs> maybe, maybe, but everybody has their own way. Yeah. And, I, and I'll, give, um, I'll give an example later um, mm -hmm. uh, of, you know, some of, some of my experiences with this as well. Um, but I want to just mention very Do you quickly, have a I don't know. I mean, sometimes we linger, we go over by, you know, by five or 10 minutes. Yeah, I think we need like 15 minutes at least for the strategy. All right, I'm gonna move fast, okay. Um, so we won't talk about the higher levels, but you can see them here. Um, this is just to show you where, what direction it all moves in as well. Um, that uh, it doesn't just stop at FEDC six. There are other examples of how, and you can see four to seven, uh, six to ten and ten plus, just different ways of thinking. I like Sally better than Stephanie because she has great toys, and that can move them to I like Sally a lot more than Stephanie because she is nicer to me when I'm upset. And then here I shouldn't do that because it isn't the right thing for me to do. It may be okay for them. So these are just different just examples of different ways of thinking that will come later on. Um, but if we have any questions about this, you can ask me after. Um, okay, so then that was all the D, okay? And, and that's the model, that's the, the house we're building, the ladder, whatever metaphor we want to use. Then we have the I, the individual differences. Um, so I, I'm not going to spend much time here because as I said, we already covered this in great detail. Um, and honestly, as, you know, as the, the play therapist, the floor time therapist, I would you know, say to the OTs, what do you know about the child's sensory system that I need to know? Because you know, they are the experts. So, you know, we all put this together, but it's an understanding that this is important. You know, the child who, um, the child who will um, respond a certain way to a certain stimulus might be different from another child who will respond differently to the same stimulus. I'll just tell one quick story that I think is a, a fascinating example of this. I was working with uh, an after-school program, and we had this whole group of um, teens who are on the spectrum, and we're in this big gym. So you can imagine, we have the padding on the walls, but there's nothing on the ceiling. All the noise is bouncing around, it's very loud. And I see two kids sitting up on the windowsill together, a 14-year-old boy, a 13-year-old girl. Um, two kids who usually kind of stay off to themselves. And I see them both sitting up on the windowsill together, and they're both covering their ears. And I said to one of my colleagues, I'm like, you know, in a way, this is really nice. They're doing something together. They're both, you know, covering their ears together. And he said, but the thing is, if you actually look closely and you know these two kids, the boy is covering his ears. He's putting his fingers in his ears because the sound is too much for him. It's way too loud, he can't handle it. The girl is cupping her ears, trying to take in as much sound as she can because she doesn't get this kind of stimulation and she loves it, and she is in heaven right now, getting all of this. So even though we're looking at the two of them, and it looks like they're doing the same thing in response to the same thing, their motivations behind it are actually the opposite. So if we didn't know that, we would respond to both of them in the exact same way. So the relationship piece then is, uh, in many ways, uh, I think the core of DIR floor time, even though the R comes last. Relationships are the organizers of development. They give meaning to our experiences. Um, we have a relationship, through our relationships, we build empathy, we build understanding, and a common language of effective communication. Right, so we can see, we can see the relationships here in, in many different ways. I, I always like the example of a little kid who's walking along, they fall down, and they look to their parents and they say, am I hurt right now? <laughs> you know, how are you gonna react? Because based on how you feel, that's how I know I should feel about this situation. Um, through our relationships, we also embrace the complexity of the process, of, uh, the, the complexity of the process and the necessary flexibility to negotiate our lives. Okay, so we do that through others and we do it when it's a, a safe space. I think Melissa gave the example before of you know, the child who is great in school 
and then they come home and then they just seem to lose it, mm -hmm. right? So, you know, I've heard this described as a, a soda can, that if you shake the soda can up all day, when you open up the soda can, what do you expect is gonna happen? But why does a child do that at home? It's because that's where they feel safe. That's where they know it's okay for me to have this feeling. I've been working so hard and now I just need to let all this out. And I feel safe to do this here with you because I know that I'm safe with you through our relationship. I know this is okay and I know we'll get through it. Mm -hmm. um, relationships also help us develop self-awareness and reflection. Uh, we will talk about that um, uh, a little bit more when we talk about the strategies. So just to kind of sum all this up here, and we're just talking about the DIR part of it, right? The floor time is the strategies, we'll get to that. But the DIR is this model, this lens through which we can look at our daily lives and our development. So here, looking at, um, here we're looking at DIR altogether. So the child's individual constitutional patterns, so that's their individual differences, their sensory profile, and their caregiver relationship how they feel safely and securely with those who are teaching them, work together to promote their development up the developmental ladder with the FEDCs. So, you know, I, I, I give this example here. Let's say, imagine you're, you know, you're a teacher, right, and you see one kid is building a stack of blocks, and then another kid comes over and knocks over the blocks, right? So I would say, what do you do? And I could give you a, you know, a list of multiple choice, but the answer is D, we don't have enough information, right? So the question is, number one, I didn't tell you, is this a kindergarten class? Is this a fifth grade class? You know, is this a, uh, a mommy and me class? Where that's, you know, just how, that's something that we might expect at this age, right? Number two, what about these two kids? Is this, do they, is this how they play together? Maybe that's what the game they play. Maybe one of them builds it, the other one knocks it down and they love it, right? Maybe that's their individual differences. And number three, the relationship. What is their relationship to each other? What is your relationship as the caregiver of, I need to mend this, I need to fix it, I need to help smooth everything out? Or is it that they got it between the two of them? So that's, you know, that's what, what I kind of think about today. So in other words here, the, the child's overall functioning and their ability to participate in the world in a meaningful way is influenced by this dynamic relationship between the developmental capacities, the FEDCs, the individual differences, <coughs> and the environment, which is mediated by, all, all this is mediated by our meaningful emotional relationships. So the question, right, that I wanna, before we switch over here, I wanna, I wanna mention here. So we're here today, right, we're talking about sensory integration, we're talking about DIR floor time. And the question is, how do kids learn all these things, right? We said we don't, Put them in a room here. We're, we're not having them all sit here and learn about it. And you know, I want to give this example that I was alluding to before. Um, I was working with a family once that had a little dog that was, um, as I described, it was yippity, right? This, it was that type of dog. And I mean, great for the family, great for the kid I was working with. But one of the sisters, for some reason, thought it would be really funny to pick up the little dog and sneak up behind me and have the dog lick my ears. And I'm, I'm not specifically a dog person, but I'm not not a dog person, but I was not prepared for this. And I jumped, right? I, I was completely dysregulated. And I remained dysregulated for a good 10 minutes. It took me a long time to say, okay, all right, I'm okay, let me just relax. The kids were still talking to me, they were laughing. I was not present, you know, I could not interact with them. I couldn't help them with anything. It took me a long time to calm down and get myself back to start at the beginning, start at level one again. Okay, I'm calm now. Let me connect again with these kids. Let me have a back and forth. And then we'll problem solve, et cetera, et cetera. It took me some time, okay? And I'm somebody who knows about development. You know, I'm a therapist. I teach about this. You know, I have graduate, um, you know, programming in all of this too. And it took me 10 minutes. So I think that's, you know, that's the important part to consider here, that if it was that hard for me, then what do we think about the kids who haven't learned about this yet, right? So that's, that's the question that I want to leave now for you. <laughs> <laughs> um, so yes, just like Kavia said, if it's difficult for adults to be able to regulate themselves, it's going to be much more challenging for kids to be able to regulate themselves. There's a lot that goes into being a kid that is much different than being an adult. So there is a lack of strategies. We need to teach them, build the relationship, build the development, get them to be able to learn these skills. They don't. They're not born knowing how to do some of these things on their own. Um, there's lots of 
expectations for things, transitions, routines, school, home life. They have they don't really have a lot of advocacy to be able to say, I need to take five minutes to do my own thing. I need to be able to do math for five more minutes and then we can go do art. Like I haven't quite finished what I want to do. Um, there's limited control over their schedules. A lot of their schedules are based on school, home life, siblings, what the parents have to do. It's just life, like there's lots going on and, and it's tricky for them to be able to kind of do some of that stuff on their own. Um, one of the great things that Melissa and I always talk about is you can choose your friends, but you can't choose your family. And so if you are a kid that stays slightly more sensitive, you need a little bit more time to wake up in the morning and you have three rowdy siblings that are up and going and your house is already moving, that's gonna be tougher for you. If you're a kid that needs a little bit more movement, but you say have a new baby, so you gotta be quiet in the morning, that's gonna be more challenging for you to kind of meet those needs and be able to kind of get yourself regulated. Um, and then arousal in behaviors, being able to match how I'm feeling, where I'm at, and how I'm behaviorally responding um, to some of those things. So actually, one quick thing back to what Tubia said. I didn't know he was gonna pose that question. Ah, okay. But I love that question. Um, and something I loved about it was what you ended with. When mm -hmm. you said that, like, um, if it took me 10 minutes and I already learned all of that, then how could we expect a child to do that? So that's really, that's something that I think resonates with me so, so much because it's not cognitive. Like, it really isn't. Like, reacting that way was not a cognitive experience for you. Mm -hmm. And it's not a cognitive experience to re-regulate. You might have gone there and been like, I'm, I've learned all this, I should not be <laughs> acting this way, I can handle this. But that's exactly what we try to tell parents and teachers. It's like they are not thinking about reacting this way. They do not have the automatic responses and are not processing all this information and integrating it in a way that they can react without taking the 10 minutes. So just like that child, like that is exactly what happens. It is not a cognitive thing. So anyway, I went off track but because I thought that was really interesting. Mm -hmm. But um, in terms of arousals and behaviors, part, I wanted to to give another good example of this so that we can think about this and how we intervene and when we intervene with some of the sensory strategies or floor time approaches that we're going to be talking about. So I'd like you to pretend you're this yellow um, line here. And I'd like you to think that you are starting your day, so this is gonna be our day, and we're starting our day as a half full cup of coffee. So we're just gonna use that image for a second. So basically we wake up in, in the morning and we forgot to set our alarm and it's a regular school day, we to set our alarm and we are already like, oh my God, I'm going to have to quickly shower, get the kids up, make breakfast and get out of the house in like half the time. You do that, you miss the bus, apparently. You're not getting up in time, you're missing the bus. So you go to drive them to school and you have a big day, you have a presentation at the Wilton Library that you're gonna have to go to. And so missing the bus is not an option, and now it is. So now you have to drive your kids to school and you still need to get to the presentation online and you realize that your car is low on gas because you forgot to fill it and you were planning on doing it on the way. So now you're getting even more stress and feeling like a little bit regulated. So you're like, okay, I'm gonna get a cup of coffee on my way and that'll like help me calm down a little bit. You spill the coffee all over yourself. You have to go back to the house, get another shirt. You go to the presentation, things go great. But then on your way home, you get a flat tire and then you're like, realize that you forgot <laughs> to pick up ingredients for dinner and you're coming home. And the first thing that your partner says to you is like, did you pick up my dry cleaning on your way home? And you lose it. You're like, aren't you kidding me? And you just like, <laughs> you know, get mad at them and yell at them and like rant and rave about your day and how dare they have asked that of you. But really all they did was ask you a question, right? They asked you a question, but the place that you were in at the time of that question, which was a, an okay question, it wasn't that big of a deal, was that you exploded and had basically a meltdown because you had a horrible day and didn't have the time to regulate yourself back down. Mm -hmm. A lot of times we talk about the children and we're like, we don't understand what it is. Like, it could be any rhyme or reason. It could be something at school. It's never the same thing. It's never the same time of day. It's because we, although we might wake up here, if our children are sick or didn't get a great night of sleep or are slightly off or something slightly stressing them, they might be waking up on the edge and be getting to this point very quickly, and it might not be very obvious what is getting them to that point. Just like your partner didn't know all the things that happened, we don't know. Was there a kid that bumped into them during the day? Were they required to sit and miss lunch? Like, we don't know what's happening throughout the day. That is, ha and our kids do not have the tools to regulate themselves back down. Similar to what you were saying, 
and similar to what Katie's gonna go into in a moment. And so in terms of strategies and when and how to implement them, it is better, like if I had the time, because what was, what was different about my day is that it just didn't stop, right? Like it just, I didn't catch my breath. But if we had the time to help bring them down, even five little, minute little bits that can kind of keep them back down so that they can process and not be reactive and at the whim of their environment, that would be a great goal. So those little strategies that you can implement throughout the day in little ways, and we're gonna teach you a few of those, is what I think is important to remember with this, this picture here. Um, so to that end, you have a nice strategy for us to try out, right? <laughs> and, um, oh yeah, absolutely. Can I just ask, so about that around here, can we, can we teach our kids, apart from like the strategies of how to get back down, mm -hmm. can we teach them like cognitively, yeah. this is a thing that can happen and that will happen to all of us, mm -hmm. but you might feel out of control because there's a very good reason why you might feel out of control. Mm -hmm. And yeah. so you take it on a cognitive level, level they will, we can teach you how to do it, but first you just need to know that this can happen and, Absolutely. and it's okay and there's ways to get back it, to you it. Know, depending on the age, the kid, the relationship, who's describing this to them, it might be the biggest relief in their life to know that they are mm -hmm. not, that there's a reason this is happening and that we can work together to start identifying when you're beginning to, that, yeah. to feel that way. And, and it's different based on the age it really is yeah. and what they're going through, but there's definitely ways of intervening in that way to give them the self-esteem boost that they kind of really can use mm -hmm. and the reason why it's happening and to have that empowerment and buy-in. And I think that's very key across all ages, actually. Mm -hmm. So yeah. But remember though, from your triangle at the beginning, that cognitive piece comes later on. So right. if you were to say, like I would tell myself, calm down, you can do this, right? That's trying to use the cognition when you don't have the bottom of the pyramid in that moment currently all you know uh, buttoned up as it should be. But it, it doesn't even have to be a cognitive piece. It could be like, I'm observing, like right. you're you're feeling this way, let's go do this. Like you don't mm -hmm. have to give them the cup, but it, or be like, I get why you're feeling that way and just empathize. Like it really depends right. on where they're at, which is what we're all kind of saying. Right. And, yeah. and so to explain, yeah. explain that cognitively, you would need to wait until they're, or we'll help them get to an optimal stage where they can actually receive that information yes. and not in the moment. We, we would totally go through that. I mean, it, again, depending on what exactly is going on, because obviously mm -hmm. some yeah. children have extreme meltdowns and it, it needs the environment to be safe. Yeah. But yes, I would always give my children space and then have the conversation. Mm -hmm. right. Yeah, you can't really in the moment. But if they're yeah. being dangerous, of course, you have to intervene. Mm -hmm. <laughs> yeah. 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 I'm just going to add like that, like with open behavioral therapy, yep. mm -hmm. DBT, uses mindfulness. Um, to do just that, um, the mindfulness strategies that you learn and practice, especially if you do the group part of DBT, not just the one 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 that's what you do. You actually interrupt the process of having a meltdown way beforehand and you practice the strategies. And then when you go to group sessions, you practice together what worked, what didn't that week, and you get the group to help you with that, to practice those strategies. DBT is great for that. Um, so I'm gonna talk about this really briefly. If you guys have any specific questions about behaviors that your child or the children that you're working with that you'd like to talk about after, we totally can. But one of the things I like to kind of bring this up is it is it sensory, is it behavior? And I kind of like to say that it's never just behavior. There could be some sensory components, there could be some behavioral components, but it's not just what we're seeing. It's that iceberg image, it's that pyramid image, it's that triangle perspective, there's a lot going on. And some of the things that you could be seeing, control-seeking behaviors, rigidity, if your child has meltdowns really easily, if your child doesn't like to share, like simple things like that that you're just observing, whether it's positive, negative, it's coming from somewhere. And so if we kind of take a step back and be like, well, why am I seeing what I'm seeing? Maybe I need to go down the ladder a little bit and look at, are they regulated? Are they feeling safe? Are they feeling comfortable? And then um, being able to see, is it the environment? Check in with, say, the, the nanny or the babysitter. Check in with some family members. Check in with the teacher. Are they seeing this in other places? Mm -hmm. And kind of put on that sensory and that DIR and that floor time hat and kind of say, okay, where else can I see where this is coming from? And can I do some other kind of ways to approach it? And then once you kind of look at it from other pieces, sometimes you do do a little bit of some behavioral strategies that help reshape it. But I kind of like to say that it's, there's other ways to look at it. There's different ways that we kind of help our kids instead of just looking at what we're seeing. It's like, why am I seeing this? 
Um, so now we're going to talk about the strategies that you guys have been really, really excited about. So one of the things that we always like to say is small steps can lead to big changes. Um, I always like to tell the parents and anybody attending a presentation is we're going to give you a ton of strategies and it might feel a little bit overwhelming, but little things can make a big difference. So you can just modify one part of your morning routine and do it for the week and then you can modify another part of your morning routine and do it for the week. If you have multiple children or if you have multiple kids that you work with, you can do it in a group or you can do it with just them. Um, one of the biggest things about this is frequency. So doing it more often, doing it multiple times a day is better than doing it for longer. Um, I don't want you guys to feel overwhelmed like you need to kind of throw all these things in and change your routine and change the structure to become more successful. You can pick and choose things that work for your routine, work for your lifestyle, and kind of add those in and kind of really help um, do it. One of the things that Melissa and I always like to talk about is savvy awareness. So savvy scheduling. Like, what? when is the best time for me to do this? Okay, I'd love to do this in the morning, but I have to get out the door, so it's not the best time for me to do this. Maybe, yeah, maybe in the afternoon in between, you know, soccer pickup or something like that. That could be the time. I can implement some of those strategies. Um, and one of the things that we're gonna do in our next little movement break is we're gonna talk about the sequence of the strategies. So if you guys all look at the card that you have, it's an applesauce card. So we kind of made it a play-based sensory activity. So if you guys will indulge me, we're all gonna stand up and we're going to do this sensory break. So this sequence of sensory strategies is what we'd like to recommend to be able to help kids kind of regulate themselves in a short amount of time. So we start with movement, the vestibular system, we then work on the muscles and joints, the pushing and pulling, we get some tactile, and then we get some respiration. And this nice little routine, five minute solution, can give them that nice sequence of sensory stuff that's really gonna organize them. So we're all gonna stand up, we're all gonna get moving, and we're gonna pretend that we're gonna pick some apples. So what I guys want you to do is pick five apples and you're gonna pretend that you're trying to pick the apples that are at the highest, highest top of the tree. So you're gonna reach all the way up and look, and look for the biggest apple you can get and then you're gonna bend all the way down and put the apple in your basket. And it's key that you guys are looking, like mm -hmm. using your eyes and moving your yep. head upward. And yep, and so then tipping your head up and really looking and then going all the way down because your visual and your vestibular system, like we said, are really closely linked to how you can move. So then we'll get our third apple all the way down. And why don't we do four? So we'll get our last apple. And we'll pick one up there. Get and a green one, guys. Put it in the back. Yeah. <laughs> <laughs> All right, so now we have our apples. So the next thing we need to do is sound them to be able to make applesauce. So we're going to do 10 big sounds. And you're going to want to really use those muscles to really stomp in there. Two, three. Are you stomping? Is everyone stomping? Are you squishing those apples? Four, six, seven, eight. Now that we stomp them, we need to squeeze out the juice. So you're going to start at the top of your shoulders and squeeze your arms all the way down and then squeeze your hands to get the juice out. And then we'll do one more. So starting at the top, going all the way down, squeezing your arms, getting out all that juice and squeezing your hands. And so when I say it with my kids, we've now made the applesauce, but it's too hot to eat, so we have to blow it out. So I want you guys to take a deep breath in and then we're going to blow it out as long as my fingers are up. Ready? strategy so we have um, another one um, as well but doing that vestibular movement and following it with the crow to tap down the respiration is kind of our little sensory system that we like to talk about to kind of really give them a little bit of everything and kind of get them really regular. It's, it's actually an organizing sequence that is like can generically work with any and every kid so you're the reason vestibular can be very alerting and just regulating and the reason we are starting with the vestibular is so many of our kids that are fidgeting or actually need to activate that movement system more and it only can be activated which is why it's going to be particular about using your vision if you're using your head you have mm -hmm. to literally move your head up or down like just walking is not going to activate that and looking or having them try to look is actually linking to sensory system so even if it is overstimulating for them because you're following it up with the proprioceptive system that's releasing that calming neurotransmitter it's reorganizing it and it actually becomes a therapeutic activity where you're teaching your brain to process information in a healthy way versus just giving them input for the sake of giving input. So you're pairing it and helping the brain process in a way that's actually healthy and having them utilize it. And so there, and then the tactile and the respiration, I know we're short on time, but there is a reason for that exact sequence. 
And I do have another card that gives you like another fun activity that's in the same sequence and you can have fun and experiment and do whatever you want. And I'll just leave these for you guys to have for yourselves if you want them. But um, you can be very creative and do whatever you like. I know you guys have a lot of creativity amongst you. <laughs> so, um, and we're going to pass it along to Julia to be able to kind of go over some of the four-time strategies. Yes, so, and we'll go quickly here because um, I know we're up against the clock. So just to kind of back up to what we were saying, the DIR model, right, this is our lens through which we can look at the child's development, right, through, through their experience in the world. So floor time is the practical play-based application of that model. Okay, so floor time, as it comes from the name, floor time, you kind of have to just get down on the floor with the kid. But what that means is you have to meet them where they're at, right? So kind of we gave the example before, you know, can we approach them in a cognitive place? It depends. Are they in that cognitive place? We wouldn't say to a two-year-old, all right, now have a seat. Let me explain to you why this tantrum is not helpful to us right now. You can't quite do that, right? If they're dysregulated, you have to meet them at level one. You know, even in that example with, with the kids with the dog, Right, if they were still trying to interact with me at levels three, four, five, but I was not at the place where I could interact with them. So they didn't meet me at my level. So that's, that's a big idea here in floor time that we want to play with a purpose, okay? We want to understand where the child is on the developmental ladder, which of these FEDCs, where are they currently holding, why is it they're there, and then how do we help them move up that ladder based on the context of our shared environment. So uh, let's take a look here. These are the main basic ideas. If you just want a one, two, three of what it is, it's we follow, we challenge, and we expand. So we follow the child's lead. We, that's, that has to do with the meeting and where they're at. We see where is it that you are going. Let me join in your world. The idea of floor time is to make the adult more able to enter the child's wor world. It's just thinking about this different way for me to become a part of this world. So we have to follow the child's world. You can't come and be, you know, kick the door down, okay, here's what we're doing today. The kid's not gonna respond to that, right? If you start with what they're up to and what they like to do, then you're joining in where they are. Then, once you've joined in, once they see that they can share the space with you, then you can challenge them to be creative and spontaneous within their world, right? So that's thank you for letting me join in your world, let's have fun in this world. But then once you've done that, you can start to say, and only when, well not only, but from the re relationship being strong and solid, you can expand that and say, let me show you a little bit of my world. You know, then you can bring them out, incorporate different senses, incorporate different motor skills, and other emotions. Right, so here too we wanna kind of line this up in a similar way. But we start with follow, then we challenge, and then we expand. And if we wanna look at some of these specific strategies, and we can move through these um, kind of quickly, just because of time, but I'll hang around if anybody has any more questions. Um, first, we want to follow the child's cues. This is very important. What is it that they are telling us? Whether it's a six-month-old who is trying to get your attention, or whether it's you know, a 13-year-old who is giving you a cold shoulder because they don't want to talk to you right now. Okay, that's reading their cues. So the question is, are we attuned? Are we misattuned? And if we are misattuned, do we have to repair? And this is an important thing that I always say to parents. How much of the time, percentage-wise, do you think is a good amount of time to be on the same page with the child? What do we think? Give me, give me a number. What, what's a good amount of time where we want to be on the same page, the same attunement with them? 75. 75, okay, anybody else? What do you think? I'm gonna say way too high. Five Based minutes. on research, if you are attuned with your child 30% of the time, that is fantastic, okay, 30% is great because we are very rarely attuned with everyone with us. So what we're then teaching our child is when there is that misattunement, how do we repair that? When there has been a breakdown, how do we fix that to get reattuned once again? And that's an important skill that the kid learns. I, I always say from floor time, right, that we said this is the practical application. Um, I like to refer to this type of work and the, the work that I do is why I do it in the child's homes, in their community with the whole family, is that this is the boots on the ground. This is the real life application in real time. As things are actually happening, we're playing, and me, you know, as, a, as the adult here, I'm playing the role of the other kid on the play date. But it gives the kids the, the opportunity to experience the positive um, feelings of having this interaction. So one of those is, yes, attunement is great, misattunement happens, but 
we can still repair, we can fix, we can keep playing, no problem. Um, I think a lot of times we look at kids who might get lost on the playground, it moves so fast, all right? It's hard to catch that and repair, but if you can slow it down and you can help them, uh, then they learn how to do that, and that's done through play. You are, if you are responsive to your child, presume competence and respond in kind. I think this is very important. Understand that every behavior has a reason. I, I always like to, to use this example, and this is a, this is a good example <coughs> to look at, that if we were to see a child who is spinning, right, and they are spinning in circles, right, so perhaps we might say this is an inappropriate behavior, right? We could say that. But from the floor time approach, we look at that and we say, okay, but why is the child doing this? There's a reason behind it. It's not just because. There's something that they are getting from this. So what I would do at floor time is I would stand next to the kid and I would start spinning too. And we'll spin together. And now it's not an activity that is isolating. Now it's something that we are engaging over. And the child starts to see, okay, it's not just me. This is someone entering my world. And then as I get to build this relationship, I can understand why is the child spinning. I can you know, talk to the OTs and find out specifically why the child is, is spinning. And then I can, through that trust with the child, say, okay, thank you for showing me this about your world. What if we tried doing this? You know, what if we tried, um, well, you guys would say what to do instead, but what yeah. if we tried this? And yeah. does it feel the same way? Does it give you the same thing? And it's through that, that trust, you know, through that relationship that they're able to experience something new. Um, build upward, this is the meet the child where they're at right now, this we've talked about. Um, use play, you know, this is, this is the way to woo the child, follow, engage, join, challenge. It's done through play. Like I said, we're not saying, okay, have a seat, we're gonna talk about this now. That's not gonna work, do it through play. We use natural interests. Um, I say count the dinosaurs, right? If you're trying to teach a kid math and they love dinosaurs, well, floor time approach, you better believe we're counting dinosaurs. We're not gonna count something else that they don't care about. They already have a natural interest in it. Um, we wanna use problems, right? So if you, providing this floor time, you are curious, oh, what is that? What, what are you doing? I, I don't understand, how are we gonna get there? Well, we're outside now, how are we gonna get from here to, to where we're going? Who's gonna drive? Let the child think about these problems, let them figure it out with you, and then they learn problem solving. But again, remember, they have to be regulated, they have to be connected with you, the reciprocity, that's all necessary, that's all there. Pretend play is fantastic for this. You can be an active player, you can highlight the emotional content, um, and, and this I think is really good that you can, you know, say a child is aggressive, right? So you can be playing like with your dino trucks or whatever it is, and then they crash into your dino truck, so you can say, ow, that really hurt. I didn't like that. That, that, that hurt my body, that hurt my feelings. And if you were just to say, now listen, when you hit your friend, it hurts their body, it hurts their foot, that's not gonna work. But if we do it through play, we say, oh, Batman and Spider-Man need to figure out how to work together to solve this problem. What are we gonna do? I have, yeah, I, I won't bother throwing that, just we're over on the time. But um, most of my day involves putting on various costumes. <laughs> um, I dress up as a tomato before. Um, <laughs> embrace the bad feel, and embrace all feelings. And let the child know there are no bad feelings. Okay, it is a feeling is a state, not a trait. You might be sad right now, and that's okay, but you are not sadness. And you might be super excited right now, and you know you may not be excited 10 minutes from now, but we can always come back here. You might feel sad again later, and that's okay. I, I like to, to give this example. I say that childhood is messy, right? It's, it's a huge mess, and sometimes all the kid needs is for you to sit in that mess with them. So that's, that's what I think with, the, with these feelings. Um, we want to enrich our ideas, right? So we want to facilitate, uh, this is the expand, the third part, to the next step. Sometimes, you know, they will get stuck in the play. Where can we go from here? Ask the questions, let them figure it out, let them think about it. And this is more for us, we have to self-reflect. We have to say, okay, how did I do there? What worked for me? Why, was there something in there that maybe triggered me that I responded in this way because of? It's important for us to know ourselves so that we can be the most available to the children. Um, so we ran through these very, very quickly. Um, but uh, okay. we can talk more. I think we're gonna skip through this. Actually, okay. I realize we're completely out of time. So yeah. I'd rather open it up for you guys to ask um, questions. Um, yeah, so here's just 
I figured well, you, you can always answer questions and other strategies and they can give the handouts and whatever you guys need, but I figured we'd open up for questions because I want to be sensitive to the library and the time and I really appreciate you guys sitting here. Yeah. I just wanted to ask about the, the spinning, the example that you gave, like the spinning. Um, are things like vocal tics also um, behaviors that are rooted in some dysregulation? Or are those like more involuntary, like my daughter has vocal tics where she's like, and she has to sort of think about it and it tends to come out. Is that based on some dysregulation or is that something else? And, so, and should I address it overtly or do I just try and go about it with more play. So we, I've actually worked with a lot of kids with um, with different types of tics, whether mm -hmm. it's physical or vocal, mm -hmm. um, and there's a whole array of contributing factors. So we do have some specialists that we refer to. Um, it is very common at specific ages, and it is also can be worsened or contribute contributions in part from sensory processing or even speeding up the processing between the language hemisphere as well so like you can like work on some of those things and see if they lessen um but there is like a lot of things that could be contributing to that that i wouldn't feel comfortable saying it's sure. definitely that yeah, sure. no, i think it's like a whole bunch of things that could be going on yeah. and is it ever nutritional like mineral deficiency or that i don't know it could be but i'm not i'm not aware of that knowledge mm -hmm. how about yeah. rocking <laughs> 